the most relevant experience that I can share um, that's relevant to the, the group at large is that um, when we first started Datascope, uh, and this is a picture of Mike, the other co-founder, messing around with a couple of other people, um, we came from academia. Um, we were very proud of our academic pedigree. We were well published. Um, we had worked in reputable areas. And that was all very exciting. And I think um, we thought that that was, that was how we were going to advance our space, was by doing the right analytics for the right, at the right moment. And um, that is something that we've, we prided ourselves on. And believe it or not, we were actually able to sell a few projects under that guise. Um, but one of the things that we learned is that, uh, yes, doing the right type of analysis is important, but it's much, much more complicated than that. Um, and namely, uh, and this is for your pleasure, Dean art. <laughs> uh, it's a special genre of art that uh, Tim likes to tease me. It looks a lot like a fifth grader. Um, it's probably about right. Um, at any rate, um, one of the things that's really complicating to doing good data science work is that we're ultimately designing these things for people. People that have lives and they're, they're busy, they have got a busy calendar, they're constantly bombarded by notifications, they're working on various applications, they have a laundry list of things that they're trying to do, maybe in the form of sticky notes that they post on the side of their monitor. They have families and these people, they work in companies and within those companies they have different organizational units that need to work together. Those companies exist within this fabric of the economy. All those things are complicating and important to consider as we design algorithms and interfaces that are ultimately using data as a resource. Um, so to make a long story short, in my opinion and my experience, there's no textbook data science problem. There's no textbook AI problem. That doesn't exist. If you find one, let me know. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, but in my experience, things are very ambiguous. And that ambiguity primarily shows itself in two different ways. Um, the first is that um, when it comes to working with data, goals often shift as you learn more. And to illustrate this, you can imagine being, for example, the, uh, working with the San Francisco Park District and being asked, hey, um, you know, we've got this, this great park, we've got a river that runs through it, and we've got these trees, but we want to plant more trees. Uh, can you help us identify the best locations to plant these new trees? And that seems like a very straightforward objective statement. Um, nobody's going to complain and say, oh, that's underspecified. But as you start to dig in and, ex and explore what that might actually mean, you have questions like, how many, how many trees are we talking about? Uh, can we, what kinds of trees? Can we move old trees? Can we replace old trees? You know, what are the parameters just within that simple domain of the trees can you mess with? Um, the second is maybe a little bit more obvious, but what do you mean by best? Is that aesthetically pleasing? Are we trying to maximize growth or increase, increase foliage? Is this about carbon dioxide emissions? Um, what, what exactly are we trying to do? I mean, you can even imagine doing things to optimize the flow of people walking through the park. Um, all of these factors really play a, a dramatic role in how you work with data. And, and specifically, as you try to solve one of these problems, you learn something about the resulting solution that causes you to question the original statement in the first place. So you might start by trying to increase foliage and realize that the resulting answer looks terrible. And so we need to actually focus on something else. So um, that's one core component of what makes data science problems inherently ambiguous. The other is um, maybe a little less obvious, um, which is that there are many different ways that you can actually approach data science problems. Um, you can start with something really simple like measuring market growth, um, something that I'm sure many of you might be interested in. Um, and uh, from that, you can actually take a variety of different data sources. They could be public data sources. They could be private data sources. You could be buying third-party data or any combination of those. From those various data assets, you can run any number of different analyses on top of them to understand the patterns that underlie that data and why it's valuable. And then from any of those different analyses, you could visualize them in any number of different, any number of different ways. Excuse me. Um, the, the key here is that all of these leaf nodes on this diagram are viable ways of approaching that problem. And the key is identifying which path makes the most sense for the user at hand, for the problem at hand, for the business at hand, what works for all those different constituencies. And so the way that um, what we have learned uh, through our work is really to incorporate a very human-centered approach to how we think about data science. And um, it, 
in contrast to what I think is believed in the market, which is that you, know, you go out and you spend a multi-million dollar project building a data warehouse, which is, by the way, then you have to maintain going forward and continue to build, and then slap a BI tool on it, and then maybe as an afterthought, think about how you present that to people. We want to put people first and foremost in this process and make sure that we're understanding the, the needs of those users as we're going out to define the problem in the first place. Going out and broadening our idea set and coming up with hundreds, if not thousands, of different ideas about how we might approach a thing before sharpening that, those concepts, uh, maybe taking a handful of those things that we think are the most promising and making actual data-driven prototypes with those things before getting those prototypes out in front of end users so they can experiment with them in the wild and see whether the data and the hypotheses that they actually have manifest themselves in the real world. Um, that then fuels the next round of iteration and so on and so forth. So one thing that I've learned about my experience in coming from uh, academic, academic nerdery to, well, I'm still a nerd, but um, from academic nerdery to where we are today is that this is a really fundamental way of working that even as you take things to market is really important to do to put this in the hands of your customers, put this in the hands of your users, and learn and react as you go along. Um, and if you don't believe me, and I think somebody else pulled this uh, trick out of the hat, the talk trick hat, um, but um, George Box is this famous statistician who, uh, you've probably heard this quote before, but all models are wrong, some models are useful. And uh, I take inspiration from that knowing that actually there, any approach is the same way. And so we have to embrace this ambiguity and actually make something of it. So one thing that I, I wanna impress upon you is that I, I think that um, what's often overlooked in data science is that it's kind of this seri series work where you do the data science work, then you give it to uh, human, inter human experience designers or whatever. And um, I, I want to kind of give you a couple of examples about why co-designing things is really useful. Um, so the first example is uh, actually drawn from our work, um, and then the second one is drawn from the, the public at large. But um, the first is around bus safety. And um, so we did this project with an international transportation company. And uh, one of their core tenants, obviously, is around safety. And they have a goal every year of reducing uh, incidents by 3%. And that might not sound like a lot, but when you're really working in the realm of training and, and manuals and one-on-one in -on -one interventions, that's actually like a really strong goal. Um, and so one of the things that they do as, during the course of uh, the bus driver's work is uh, understanding, uh, they, they do these pre-trip checks and they try to understand what's going on around the bus. They check to make sure that the stop sign is coming out. They ch check to make sure that the back door opens. They make sure the tire pressure is right and they record it all on these little devices. And as they walk around the bus, um, the, the thinking among their, their team is that, well, listen, we, we have these, this data about how people are checking the buses. Maybe there's a broken windows hypothesis where you know, if you're not doing a good job on your pre-trip checks, you might therefore not being, be a good driver for us. And there, the overriding thesis was that you know, if you take, um, you know, if you're taking any less than eight minutes or more than 10 minutes, and doing these pre-trip checks that ultimately you're not doing a, a good job and that you might be more prone to, to having accidents down the road. So um, what we did is we, this is a technique that we commonly do. Um, it's a little hard to see maybe, hopefully it's better from your angle, but um, we took lots of, uh, we generated lots of images and did this concept of small multiples where we throw lots of different plots up on the, on the wall and try to understand and study them to see the, the patterns that emerge. We looked at things like, for example, um, looking at these uh, inspection durations as a function of time for each driver. So this is for each driver. Uh, each circle here is the amount of time that they took in seconds on the, on the y-axis. And one of the things that I want to impress upon you is how much variability there is here. Um, at the low end of the spectrum, there's, people are doing this in a minute. And at the high end of the spectrum, they're taking 15 minutes or more. Um, and this isn't uh, because they're necessarily lazy, it's just because the variability of their routine changes. They get a text message and all of a sudden they're responding to an emergency at home. Um, the, the red vertical line is when they had, this particular driver had a tra traffic incident. So they got in an accident. Um, and this starts to tell us the story of how, um, whether or not people's patterns, patterns here change before and after the, the accident. 
and I mean, you might be able to see a pattern. You might be able to convince yourself that there's like some decreasing pattern here. Um, the, the point being, though, that when you look at this in the broader scheme of lots of different users, and here I'm showing 12 different users that we've randomly selected, there isn't a whole lot of consensus. There's generally a lot of spread, perhaps with the exception of this person who is a robot, <laughs> and probably this person who is also a robot but got in two accidents, so they're a bad robot. Um, but the point being that you know, there is considerable variability, and it isn't fair to judge everybody on the same criteria. People are different. They're individuals, and th that individuality is what makes it difficult to detect these patterns in the wild. So one of the things that we did is we, um, coming out of this little exploratory analysis gig, we did a quick sprint to explore whether we could anticipate whether accidents are happening. We tried lots of different models. I don't want to get into the gory details. But one of the things that um, we were able to do is we were able to actually anticipate 22% of accidents two to three months in advance. And that is meaningful, it's a meaningful time scale because that's the time scale over which they could possibly have an intervention. So they could maybe go out into the field and ask drivers if they're doing okay or whatever it is. The hard part about this is that, you know, we're, this is a proof of concept, so we're just trying to show that this is possible. The false negative rate, or the number of people that we were falsely accusing of getting in accidents was quite high. <laughs> um, but I think what this speaks to is the importance of not just overthinking the algorithm, which you can easily do. That would be a textbook problem. In the real world, though, we have to design solutions that actually meet human needs. And so co-designing those experiences, or co-designing that algorithm while we're, for example, thinking about the types of interventions that we might take is a really critical way to, to you know, do data science at the next level. So what, those interventions could look like anything from a personal touch. You know, if somebody's having a bad day, walking out to the parking lot with them and giving them a cup of coffee and saying, hey, thanks, thanks for doing a great job. How are things going at home? <laughs> Um, or whether it's actually giving a bunch of people training, or whether you're actually giving disciplinary measures, or maybe even firing people. The, all those things, that spectrum of interventions, depending on where you land on that spectrum, the severity of those false positives changes quite a bit. And so taking that into consideration as you're designing these models to be thoughtful about the types of interventions that you're doing while you're designing the algorithm to begin with. Okay, so that's, that's a bit about bus safety, a topic that I never dreamed I'd get into when we started Datascope. Um, another one uh, is also near and dear to my heart, mostly because I'm a gigantic documentary fan, um, particularly when it comes to David Attenborough. Um, but how, how many of you, just a quick show of hands, are familiar with the Netflix Prize? All right, for, for everybody else, the Netflix Prize was a competition that uh, Netflix hosted in um, 2006 to uh, try to improve the quality of their recommendation system. And so this is a screenshot of my Netflix. Sorry to overshare. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things that you'll, you'll notice about my Netflix is I, I do like my nature documentaries, um, but I do not like Jack Hanna at all. Um, can't, can't stand the guy. He talks about animals murdering other animals. They don't do that, they eat. Um, Anyway, uh, they predicted three stars for me. Um, and this is obviously before thumbs up, thumbs down. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but uh, at the time of the Netflix prize, you weren't even given categories. It was just a wall of videos. And you, it was actually a wall of videos that you could rent, not even stream yet, um, if you can re remember that. <laughs> um, so at the time, the, the state of the art was to have basically popularity rules um, and actually doing much better than uh, personalizing things beyond the popularity of an item is quite hard. And one of their big innovations actually was going beyond this mean rating model to developing something called collaborative filtering, which now is in most machine learning textbooks. And that re reduced the uh, mean standard error on those ratings by about 10%. So we went from you know, one and a little change on the plus or minus stars to a little bit less than one. And the challenge of the Netflix prize was to reduce it another 10%. So they had this two-year competition. Thousands of teams from around the world participated in this, in this competition to try to um, improve the accuracy. And I remember this very vividly because this happened right, as we were, uh, right around the time we were starting Datascope. And we thought about throwing our hat into the ring. And within a month, uh, the leading teams had reduced it by 7%. We thought that there was, you know, 
for sure somebody was going to get it in the next month. And it ended up taking him another 22 months to get to that final answer. And the final answer um, was actually uh, so sufficiently complicated, it actually combined lots of different um, models together at the very, very end. Um, and they edged out another team, which is another dr dramatic twist to the story. But at any rate, um, Belcour's Pragmatic Chaos ended up winning this million dollar prize. But it was so complicated that they couldn't actually use it in production, um, which is a little known fact about that um, prize. Um, and the reason, one of the things that we noticed as this uh, competition was going on is that there are a couple of factors that make doing this, uh, making, doing personalization in real life rather difficult, particularly as it relates to Netflix. At the time, they didn't have this concept of, um, well, for one thing, they made, they made it a lot easier by designing an interface <laughs> that has lots of different categories. And what those categories do is they contextualize the way in which we interpret the personalization. Um, they give you trust in the system. They make you understand why you're, you're being recommended particular things. Another really important feature was that they built in uh, profiles. And if you look at my, <laughs> my Netflix, you can see what Dean watches and then what the rest of my family watches. Um, and really, the, the ability to tune that between different profiles is, a, is an important feature that makes it easier to personalize for an individual or an, a mood if you if you're smart about your Netflix profiles as a pro tip, um, <laughs> that you can actually tune those things in and out. Um, and the last innovation that they've most recently done is um, you know, thinking about, oops, excuse me, um, starting to bake in the thumbs up, thumbs down. And in part, that, that's a trick to uh, remove the ambiguity of a star rating. It's actually really difficult to interpret what that means. Um, and so that's kind of another user experience, how user experience and machine learning uh, coexist. So another little vignette here, both of which I think speak to the value of co-designing these different things. Um, the, the last thing that I kind of want to leave you with is um, someone that we've grown very fond of at Datascope and, um, and others have been talking about, Doug Engelbart. Um, in fact, I think he's even come up a little bit today. Um, but Doug Engelbart had this really uh, phenomenal series of things that happened in the mid-60s, uh, starting with one of his papers in 1962 and culminating in the, I think it's called the mother of all demos in 1965, where he demoed uh, internet, um, GUI interfaces, uh, HTTP protocol, and a handful of other things in the same hour and a half demo. It's really awesome. It's on YouTube. You should check it out. Um, but one of the things that he's quoted is, is using this phrase of augmenting human intellect. And I think there's a real opportunity when it comes to, there's a lot of naysaying about data science and artificial intelligence and how it can do these really terrible things and be biased against people or different demographic groups. And by getting out ahead of that and learning from people what their real needs are, we have this real opportunity to speak to that and de design directly against it by augment thinking of things as augmenting human intelligence, not just uh, replacing it. So thank you for your time. If you would like to talk about this more, I'd, this is obviously a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, thank you very much.